All right, so I think we're already live, and this is going to take a couple of seconds here to come up, and uh, we should be getting some good live streaming quality here, both for the video, hopefully, and the audio as well. Uh, if you see this right now, if you're just joining, if you're just Look at everything. Let me know in the chat how this is coming through in the live chat function. You can just tell me. And um, looking forward to jumping on here for this uh, surprise live Q&A. Hey, Metal Source Studios, White Wolf. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let me know if this is coming through all right for you guys. I just literally decided to jump on a quick uh, surprise live Q&A here. I didn't put too much time into setting things up. So I just wanted to kind of go on the fly and just see how it works. So I think uh, this should be fine. I'm seeing already some of the comments. Hey guys, uh, Atik, Counting Up, Luke, Jerry, Linux, Rangero, uh, Jerry, Litza, Andrew. Awesome dudes. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's an amazing day here in Barcelona. Actually, sun just went out. I was walking around the city. Uh, there was the Mobile World Congress right now happening in the city. So it's super cool. Lots of great events happening, so uh, excited to share some of that vibe with you guys here as well as answer some questions. And I see already some questions coming through in the chat, so definitely keep dropping the questions in the chat because I'm going to go through them and I'm going to answer as many as I can in as much detail as I can to help you guys out, just to give you guys some of my time here. Uh, this is... After a long day, I also apologize ahead of time if I'm a little bit tired or if I'm a bit sloppy with words because I've been working for about 10 hours already. Uh, right now it's 6, about to be 7 p.m., so I am exhausted, but I'm going to give my best to share some good scientific facts with you guys and some knowledge that you guys can apply and improve your health and fitness and yourself as a person. So let's dive into it. I'm going to uh, check out some of the comments uh, to see what questions we have and uh, awesome and welcome everybody. So let me check in question here from um, <laughs> from Brandon. Uh, just wanted to know if I wanted to burn off as much fat as possible, do I cut out the carbs? But if I do this, would I lose much muscle mass? So you don't actually need to cut out carbs to lose body fat. It just matters that you cut out total calories, which can be both from carbs and fats compared to when you're maintaining your weight or when you want to gain weight. So you don't have to go low carb as far as your diet. I do have, for example, I'm, I'm going to use my clients as case studies as my guinea pigs here. Um, we don't really do a lot of low carb dieting unless someone really prefers to eat for keto for some other reasons and some people feel better doing that. Uh, we normally don't do a lot of low carb just because of high volume training because that high volume training usually works better with higher carb and most people actually prefer to eat a bit more carbs. So you don't really need to cut out carbs but you do need to cut total calories. Now that's going to be some from carbs, some from fats because we know scientifically that a high protein diet is the best way to go to, for preserving lean body mass and if you have a good training program you may even be able to build muscle mass if you're a beginner and intermediate. It's very common to actually build muscle mass a little bit at least while you're losing fat. And for all these things to happen, you definitely want to train really hard, but I don't recommend cutting out carbs. I'm not a really big fan of this modern mainstream uh, conventional wisdom right now, which is just basically promoting keto and low carb as the best approach to lose weight, which is definitely not true. It's certainly not true for any of the like evidence-based uh, studies that we look at. I mean, we look at meta-analysis, systematic and, uh, reviews. We can clearly see that people that, whether you cut out carbs, whether you cut out fats, it doesn't really matter. Like the result is the same. So don't really worry about it, whether, you know, how much you're going to lose. You're going to get great results. Uh, just make sure the calories are in a deficit and you're going to be totally fine. Uh, cool. Cool. So I am going to go through some of the other ones, so bear with me. Um, what is my opinion about mini cuts for teens when they are not pretty lean but not fat? So look, I'm going to be very straightforward and brutally honest here with you, and that's the only way I know how to communicate this. If you're in a teenager right now, do not cut for fuck's sake, okay? Like, do not go on a cut. Like you don't need to go on a cut, okay? If you're a teenager, you're growing, which means that you just need to lift weights, get better at lifting weights, 
condition your body to get better in the gym, get stronger, eat a healthy diet, and don't focus on fat loss for fuck's sake. You're going to destroy your health. You're going to have all kinds of negative things coming from that. It's too early for you to develop an eating disorder and to just be food obsessed. Don't do that, okay? Like I'm telling you this, not I don't gain anything by saying this. I'm saying this because I see so many teenagers uh, get stuck in this permacut mode where consistently reducing their calories, trying to look like the Instagram guy that they look at every day. Don't do that. Like do not do that to yourself. Lift, build muscle, eat healthy, make sure that you're sleeping right, make sure that you're studying your ass off and building a life for yourself. And there's plenty of times to cut body fat as you build up a lot of muscle. Like you will find it much easier when you have enough muscle mass to you're carrying. If you build up, let's say 10, 20 pounds of muscle, that fat loss phase that's gonna come after you go out of your teens is gonna be amazing. And so do not do a cut or any kind of mini cut. Like. I'm being very serious about this because I see too many teenagers. I have cousins reaching out to me. I have people reaching out to me, like younger people are watching my videos. When I say go on a cut, that doesn't apply for like someone who's 15, okay? Like you need to build muscle, right? Just focus on eating, giving your body enough fuel to grow and build muscle. I just want to put that out there. Um, cool. Uh, dark pool. Do you need help with anything? Editing videos for Instagram? Something that really want to help you. Uh, currently, I'm not hiring for my company. We're uh, a big team at the moment. We're most of my team members that I've hired that work with me for in my uh, coaching programs. They've helped me with coaching and they help me with client success. And so we work a lot on that. I don't really do that much social media. If you haven't noticed, I post mostly myself. I, I don't really like to put out someone else's thoughts on there. I try to post the frequency that I can sustain myself and try to share as much value as I can, especially on Instagram. Uh, if you guys haven't been following me on Instagram, you can check it out. I love to do longer captions that I think provide more value. I do some stories from time to time and I answer some questions and stories because I think that also adds value. But I'm not really a big fan of these uh, mass content producing machines like a lot of guys promote, like guys like Gary Vee and other guys that just put out a ton of content. For me, that I find that unsustainable at the moment because I'm so focused on my clients and I wouldn't want my quality of work to sacrifice because I'm just having to put out so much quantity. So when I put something out on Instagram, like a post or something like that, I really try to make it as inspirational and as actionable, as practical as possible to help you and to actually make a difference in your day, in your week, in your month, in your life in general. And I'm not a big fan of like reposting memes and all kinds of stupid stuff like that. I mean, it's not stupid, it may help someone, but I think for me personally, I'd rather go for quality rather than quantity. So I currently don't need help. I'm not hiring anybody through my social media, but um, you know, in the future, I'm gonna announce if I'm taking interns or more staff because we are growing really fast as a company and uh, we're kicking ass, which I'm really proud to say. So thank you for, for offering that. Uh, cool. Uh, awesome. Uh, which book has had the biggest impact on your life so far? Wow, like that's an amazing question. So there, there's a number of books that I think have made a big impact on me personally. You could actually go uh, to tomic.com slash books to check out my top 10 books there. And I would say out of that top 10 list, all the books on there have made a significant impact on me. And just to give you some context, that top 10 that I put together, it's from 600 different books that I read over the last uh, seven years or so, I would say eight years or so by now, that I've been reading books actively and I've put together like the best list that I could possibly put together. So it, it would do a disservice for me to actually select one of those books to be my favorite because there, there is no such thing. I mean, a lot of books like psycho cybernetics come to mind, uh, books like Black Box Thinking, books like Essentialism. I think book, books like Essentialism really made a huge impact on me. If you haven't checked that one out, I highly recommend it. You cannot go wrong with it. But I do urge everybody to go out and um, check out my top 10 list at tomic.com slash books. I have a couple of things there that also a quick note for why I think the book is really good. So that's, I, I would think would give you a lot more value. But essentialism, I mean, you cannot go wrong with that book. It's just, it, it's incredible. Like it definitely changed my life for sure. Like I'm a different person because of that book for sure. Like that's one of my 
warmest recommendations that I usually give people for birthdays, or like my close friends. And uh, when I send gift cards for like Audible and stuff like that, I usually send them essentialism. Because I think people have way too much stuff in their life and they need to trim down and start saying no to stuff. And I start, I, I say no a lot. Like people that know me, that are closer to me personally, they know I'm um, like a more of a close guy as far as like, what am I letting into my system? Like I'm very careful what I let into my life. So uh, one of the reasons because of that is my tendency to be more of a minimalist and more of an essentialist because I try to focus my energy and effort on, on fewer things but doing those things well rather than dispersing my energy across the board and then not be able to deliver anything in good quality. So I think that's uh, that's a way for me that personally works really well. Now that do doesn't need to be everybody's philosophy but I feel like for me that works really well. Um, Cool. Uh, let me go through some of the other questions. By the way, guys, like amazing questions so far. You guys are freaking rocking it. I'm really enjoying this live just to tell you that because, um, you know, the questions are really good quality. Um, how do you feel about the idea of free veggies? This is a question from Phil and he's asking, not tracking things like lettuce, spinach because they're almost zero calories. Yeah, like I prefer to track everything. When I usually advise people to start tracking, I, I tell people to track everything. Just because you want to also track vegetables as you're hitting your fiber intake per day. So at least you get an idea if you're getting close to your fiber intake or not. Because many people neglect and they don't realize how many vegetables it takes to hit their fiber intake of let's say 30 to 45. Let's say somewhere between 30 and 40 grams per day if you're a guy. It's gonna take you quite a lot of vegetables to hit that intake if you combine everything, like the grains you're eating, the seeds that you're eating, the fruits and vegetables combined, you will find that you actually have to eat more vegetables than you thought. So I do prefer tracking them. The calories can add up. I mean, you'd be surprised if I'm, let's say I'm gonna give myself an example. If I'm cutting and if I'm going down to, let's say, 8% body fat and I'm really in that last stage of the diet, I'm eating such a large amount of vegetables that it does add up. I mean, I'm eating like five, six kilos of food, 10 to 12 pounds of food per day uh, from low calorie foods. So that's a lot of food. So I do track also the tomatoes, the red peppers and all those because they do add up. When you're talking about those types of amounts, they do add up. Now, if you're gaining or if you're maintaining, I don't think there's a lot of need to micromanage. I'm a control freak when it comes to my diet. I love numbers. I love tracking. I love data. So I do it anyway, because it's just a habit. You don't need to, I would still do it for the sake of the habit. And this is one of those things that guys have a really hard time understanding is that, let me give you an example. So if I'm right now at 20% body fat, which I'm not like, I'm more, more between like 12, I'd say about 12 ish or so, but let's say I was 20% body fat. If I just went on a diet right now to get down to 10% body fat, which is a lot of guys, the way I'm thinking about it is that when I'm at 20%, I want to behave in the way that would help me get to 10%. I want to build those habits ahead of time. So for me to get from 20 to 15%, I don't really need to put in that much work, but I want to start conditioning myself to do the right things and the right habits that will help me go from 15 to 10. So I'm already being very rigorous with my diet. I'm already being very on point with tracking. I'm already making sure that everything is set up because I don't wanna be surprised when I get closer to 10% body fat and now I got sloppy because I haven't been building those habits. So I want to have a lot of momentum because when I go down to 12 or 13% when food is just the intake itself is just low, I wanna be ready, I wanna be conditioned, I wanna be primed for that last phase so I can build so much momentum that it's just gonna carry me through until the end of the cut instead of trying to you know weasel my way to lose a couple of percentages without putting in the work I want to condition myself for discipline and to put in the work from day one because I know that type of mindset it will be necessary for me to finish the cut. And to finish the cut is going to be the hardest part. So that, that's my approach for this. I, I prefer to be more disciplined and generally I prefer discipline over, over trying to make it easier for myself because I know it's going to take more to finish the race. Right, and that's kind of the approach that I generally recommend as well for clients. When we work together, I push my guys pretty hard. Like uh, when we talk about training, when you talk about nutrition, I work with a lot of busy entrepreneurs and professionals, but if someone says like, look, I can only trade in three days a week and for an hour, 
I'm going to like make that one hour hell. Like you're going to really bust your ass off. And that's how you're going to see results. Because if you're training only three days a week for 45 minutes or an hour, like we got to make that intense. Like that's going to be really brutal. And that's the only way to grow. Like that's really the only way to do that. So I prefer the discipline in the harder way. That's just the na the nature of my approach in general. Like I would rather push you then try to manage things and um, you know, try to find an easy way because I just don't think there is an easy way to succeed in anything. Uh, hey guys, uh, cool. Uh, let me see. Do you remain present? Uh, Mario, do you remain? Uh, this is a question from Panasonic P2. <laughs> that, that's cool. Uh, do you remain present throughout the day? Is meditation key for you? Well, it's really hard to say whether I'm present the entire day. I'm definitely, I mean, I could probably say no with a decent amount of certainty. I think my presence really shines when I'm working, uh, when I'm putting in the work, when I'm doing something for my clients in the back end, when I'm creating a new module for them or when I'm designing new programs. I enter flow state and then time flies by really quickly. Then I know that I'm in the present moment. And that's my usual way how I get into flow state. Other ways how I get into flow state is creating content or doing public speaking or doing coaching calls. That's usually what I enter like my flow state. I try to balance it out. Like if you're too long in flow state, you will get very exhausted. So there's actually a balance between entering flow state and exiting flow state. Now this is actually a very important topic because you all here, I assume that you guys want to be very successful. So your productivity, and I, I've studied this topic, actually, I'm, I'm right now in the middle of researching um, productivity manifesto, which I'm building for my clients and for my members area. And I'm researching the topic of flow state. If we're talking about productivity, like pure productivity, you could correlate really well someone's productivity with how much time they spend in flow state. And I guarantee you, people that are on their phones all day, people that are on social media, that are multitasking, that are using their laptop and their phone at the same time or multi-screen laptops and things like that, they're barely touching the potential of flow state and they're, ever, they're almost never present. And I think that's one of the biggest issues why men and, and girls and younger generations like moving forward, why they're going to have a really hard time becoming successful is because their attention span is hijacked by social media and by all these devices. I think as far as like a competitive advantage that I would have above most people is that I can like sit down and work and without multitasking, like I can sit down and actually get work done. Like I don't care about my phone. Like I'm just going to leave my phone in a room. I'm not going to check it for an entire day or two if it takes that. And th I think that's one of the biggest things that will separate you if you want to be successful moving forward, like now in 2019, 2020, 2021 and moving on. Uh, if you're not the person that's unlocking their phone 350 times a day, which is the, the average, you're going to win. Like that's the way you're going to win in your business, in your career, with relationships, with your fitness, with anything, if you can focus, because people can't focus. Like I go out sometimes and I'm walking through the city and I'm just looking around me a little bit, you know, just trying to see what people are doing. Like most people are on their phone all the time. If you go to a restaurant, like most people are checking their phone all the time. If you actually look at what people do when they work, they're multitasking. They have multiple tabs open. There's Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, always open. If you do that, like your brain, you, you cannot enter the depth of focus and the depth of that flow state that is required for real work, for real productive work. And nothing amazing comes out of that. Like you will not be able to create amazing work if you do that. So that's my humble opinion. Uh, when we're talking about like the number one skill to be successful right now, it's focus. Like if you can sit down and work without being ADD and go all crazy, you will win. And that's actually, when I do a video, I usually do longer videos. And I always notice that there's a, I would say like a 10% or 15% of the comments that come on a video like that, that's like a 20 or 30 minute video of guys saying, or girls, I don't know, it's like a fake account or whatever, saying that the lo the video is too long. Like the video is too long or that I don't talk as fast as, as or that I don't do fancy editing. 
And that tells me a lot, actually. I mean, I, I can do those things. I mean, I can pay someone, I can hire someone to do the most amazing edits on YouTube. But like, is that really what, you know, I, I know it will help, but it shows you that there's an underlying issue of lack of focus. Because I'm trying to like legit the content that I'm putting out. I mean, I honestly believe that I'm trying to, I mean, I want to help you and I'm putting out the best as I can. So, and it's in your interest to focus, but you still can't. And I see this a lot. I see this as a big problem. So I just wanted to share this out because I think it's really important. Um, let me, uh, let me check out some other comments here. I think I'm in a little bit of a delay. Uh, volume versus intensity. What would you say is more important? Let me check this out for aesthetics, getting stronger in the four to six rep range or lots of hypertrophy work in six to 12. So the way I work, the way I design programs, I work primarily with people that are interested in building muscle. So the key is building muscle. We don't do a lot of work in the below six rep range. I don't think there's a need for that. If your goal is to maximize your physique and if you want to build muscle, you shouldn't be spending too much time in that four to six range or below four. I think one of the reasons why a lot of natural lifters are struggling with growing muscle and building a great physique is because they're focusing way too much on their single one rep max or what they do in the one to three rep range. They're trying to be powerlifters, but they're not really powerlifters. They're just trying to do things that are suboptimal for growth and they're not hitting the necessary amount of volume required to grow. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see with guys that are in the more like scientific side of fitness that, that are watching videos, educating themselves. They've bought into this dogma that, that you need to get strong to get big as a natural lifter, which is true but not, not to a point that you have to do singles every workout, like doing singles or, or doubles or triples, which means like one, two or three rep for movements. It's just not very effective to build muscle. Like you're not going to grow much. If you if you have to grow as a system, like your entire physique, you're going to have to do so much volume that you're going to get beat up and you're going to get hurt. Uh, you're, it's just not a very sustainable approach. So I think spending most of your training in the six to 12 rep range is probably a good idea. And then I would say some training sometimes maybe in the four to six range and some training in the 15 to let's say 30 range. If you want to do something like that, uh, for specific body parts, like let's say your lateral deltoids, right? So if you're trying to build a, a more like a wider physique, training those body parts in higher rep ranges is a good idea. And certain maybe corrective movements, or if you want to do something like Meyer reps, some similar techniques like that, then in higher rep ranges, I just don't recommend training like a powerlifter if you want to get big. It's just not very effective. Like the data doesn't I mean, look, you can build muscle with any rep range, absolutely, but is it more effective to do four sets of eight or like eight sets of four? It is just, eight sets of four will, will beat you up. If you can lift any amount of decent weight, like you're going to get beat up and there's a really high chance of injury as well. So those sets are very fatiguing and I don't recommend that. Um, cool. Uh, what is your beard routine? Do you use beard wash and beard oil? No, I don't. I unfortunately don't do anything. I probably should do something, but I try to control the length of my beard and I think that's doing most of the work. Um, I did let it grow really long in 2016. Actually, if you go onto the channel, the featured video, I legit have a huge beard. At that point, I was using some oils. I was uh, hanging out at some point with like Menno Hensemans and he had a huge beard as well. And we we're comparing <laughs> what, what to use and what to do with the beard. I don't recommend um, like any products because I just don't know. Like I'm not an expert in that. <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, can you lose fat and gain muscle at the same time? Yes, you can, especially if you're a beginner and if you're an intermediate lifter, which I assume you probably are if you're asking this question. So you can, it's hard, but you can, and you have to train really hard with a good optimized training routine that is hitting the exact amount of training volume that is perfect for you. And you're still progressing and you're getting stronger throughout the cut. 
and your diet is on point. And most importantly, here's the factor that people don't really think about is that your recovery is on point. So if you optimize your recovery, then you will have a higher chance of losing fat and building muscle. People that try to lose fat and build muscle at the same time and then start neglecting their sleep, their stress levels, they don't relax, they don't spend any time with friends, they just don't have a life outside of gym and hustle, they have a really hard time doing that because your body has a limited amount of recovery. And if you don't take care of the recovery, you're not going to build much muscle. You are going to maintain at best. And I think that's one of the biggest limit factors. If you're talking about successfully recomping, that's just going to be the limitation. I mean, every goal, uh, I mean, every time you want to lose fat, the goal is to build muscle. Like the stuff that is going to retain the muscle is the same stuff that's going to build the muscle. But it's just the amount of recovery capacity that you can do and the amount of training you can do is a limit factor there. So you have to be really smart uh, in the way you set that up. And knowing your body is really important here because knowing your breaking point and your limit, uh, if you want to go to your limit and you can train at your limit, that's going to take a lot of recovery. And that's where you grow. So it's really important to, uh, to have that in mind. Uh, hi, Mario. Do you have some tips for our students who can't work out more than 45 minutes a day? Man, like 45 minutes a day is actually quite a lot of time. Like you could build an incredible physique with training 45 minutes a day, three to four times a week. You're good to go. And if you can do more than that, I mean, you're winning. So I don't think that's a big limitation. I think people are limited because they believe certain things to be true, which are not like that, for example, belief that you can't get enough workout volume within 45 minutes. If I had only 30 minutes to train and if I could do that four or five days a week, I'd be very confident that I'm going to be able to not just maintain what I've currently built, but actually even progress. And it's all about how you use the time. It's all about how do you make the most out of your time. So you might not then be able to go out and practice single reps on a squat or something like that. But if you want to work on hypertrophy, if you want to build muscle, like absolutely, that's plenty of time to knock out a ton of sets. So you should be fine. Like that's definitely not a limitation. I think that's really one of the biggest problems in the fitness industry is as you educate yourself, as you watch a bunch of these videos and you start reading a lot of these articles and you start going into the comment section, you start picking up all these limiting beliefs that, for example, you can't build muscle while you lose fat or that you can't do any growth if you don't train at least an hour or you have to do these crazy ass like long routines or you have to do bro splits or you can't do bro splits. Like... It's just much more on a spectrum and it's much more gray than people realize. And that's actually a sign. Like when you guys watch a lot of videos on, on YouTube or you go out content, a sign of a true expert is someone who will tell you like, look, there's so much we don't know yet and that they can explain the context. And if you have someone speaking in hard lines, like you can't or you can nonstop, that's really a sign that that person hasn't really evolved and isn't coming from a scientific uh, perspective. Because a scientific perspective is what's most likely to work based on data and then from experience and then also from everything combined, then you can do a lot more than people think you can. So I think you, you want to calibrate it, be careful what you believe because you could really... Um, like mess up your results like that. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of great questions, guys. So just bear with me for a second here. How to, so let me see, ideal percentage to start bulking. I mean, you could start gaining weight at any percentage below 15%. I, I think this whole approach of that you can only start gaining muscle at 10% body fat or below, I think it's flawed because there's no really, there's no justified reason for it. Yeah, there is some P ratio limitations. Like if you get really fat, so if you go 20% body fat or above, then definitely there's a risk that you're not going to be building enough muscle, like compared to the amount of fat you're gaining and muscle from the weight you're putting on. But anything below 15% is absolutely fine. And I would even argue that between let's say 15, 
and let's say between 50 and 20 percent you can still be making gains and uh, going in a lean gaining phase and going in a proper uh, building muscle focus so i think this has been sort of misinterpreted in the data i've, I've had these conversations with other experts in the field and more like evidence-based experts I think the data doesn't really have this cutoff at 15% as most YouTube fitness people would say. You know, YouTube fitness people say that you get 15% body fat, all you're going to gain after that is going to be fat, which is absolutely not true. So it's more of like a range between, say, like 8 and 22% uh, that you have to go on a gaining phase. Now, that's scientifically looking at it, but then looking at it aesthetically, whether you're happy with being at 15, 16% body fat and then keep gaining muscle, that, that's totally up to personal preference. Uh, so that's something that you know yourself, whether you're comfortable with being on a higher body fat percentage and uh, keep gaining, right? Uh, that's like only you. Like I personally don't gain ever to a point where I can't see my abs. Like one part of that is just, I just don't like to feel very heavy and I feel very sluggish when I get up to a certain body fat percentage. I just feel very slow and I feel like my productivity starts to suffer and I just don't like that feeling. I like to stay leaner, so that's my personal preference. But if you aren't like that, absolutely you can keep gaining up till 20% body fat and then of course you're gonna cut a bit longer to, uh, to clean up all that body fat that you gain. Um. <laughs> Why do I always think about video games? Oh man, uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> because video games are made to uh, hook you. They're made to be addictive. I was a professional video game player. I played World of Warcraft. Before that, I played Unreal Tournament. I played uh, Dota back then when it was uh, a Warcraft 3 mod. So it was an add-on on Warcraft 3. I played all those games hardcore. And I'll tell you that my brain took close to a whole year after I quit gaming entirely to just get it out of my head. So to stop thinking about it. And I've had these conversations actually with a number of clients who are playing League of Legends or games like that, which are really addictive, like World of Warcraft. Those games are designed to suck you into a reality. And that reality is extremely rewarding because you're living in a world where you know, there, there's a new respect system and you're getting rewarded for certain things that are in the virtual world, but your brain doesn't know the difference. So it actually has an increase in social status that you're wired to experience. So there's many reasons why you keep thinking about games. This is one of the reasons why we keep thinking about social media all the time, because social media is programming you to be a little like addict. And, and it's true. Like we all know. I mean, look, what do you guys think if you... If you swipe down on your feed on your phone, like you go on Facebook, you swipe down. What does that remind you of? Like this swipe. It's a slot machine. It's literally like gambling. Like you never know what you're going to get when you swipe down. That swipe motion was taken from the uh, casinos. So you're being programmed right now, same as I am. Everybody's being programmed like right now to be addicted to social media or apps. There's engineers that are the smartest people in the world working on how to keep your attention on the platform as much as possible. And the same thing is happening with video games. So it's not a surprise that it's so hard to get rid of it because it's so deeply ingrained in your brain. Like your brain gets wired to experience that. I was so hooked on World of Warcraft, like you wouldn't believe how hooked I was on World of Warcraft. I wouldn't be able to have an, I mean, I can't have a normal conversation with people. I can't do anything in my life. I only log in and then I become alive. And when I'm outside of the game, I'm literally like a zombie. Like I just sleep, eat, and log in. Sleep, eat, log in, that's it. And my whole life was World of Warcraft. And people don't understand, if, if you've never been deeply into a game, they don't understand how it is. Like I would play for like 14, 15 hours a day, nonstop. Like I wouldn't even eat. I would barely go to the toilet. I mean, that's, it's insane. And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it because it, it's made to hook you. It's made for you to enjoy it. So it's not like I suffered. I had a, you know, some, of the, some of the most fun moments in my entire life were when my guild went on and we, we you know, got a realm first or killed some monster or got some new item that was legendary, right? That's like one of the greatest things that I've ever experienced as far as like joy, but it is fabricated, it is not real. So it's something to understand. Um, cool, 
let me see. Am I being programmed to watch your videos? <laughs> well, I, you probably are because YouTube is programming you to watch my videos. If you watch some of my videos, you're gonna be suggested to watch more of my videos. I hope so. And uh, YouTube is gonna keep you. But I, I, I try to make the videos at least informative so it, to enhance your life and for you to get off of the platform so you can go have a life. And I try to do my best with that. But yes, like YouTube is definitely trying to keep you onto the platform. I know that for sure. Cool. Um, <laughs> definitely. How to get up and get to work when you're not feeling like it? How to stay productive every day? So look, one of the one of the most important skills to be successful is to be able to do things that are independent of how you feel. So it doesn't matter how you feel. And when you have that internal chatter with yourself, if you really think deeply about it, if you really dig deeper into it, you are giving yourself permission not to go there. You are giving yourself permission to slack off. You are giving yourself permission and you're rationalizing it through because you're not feeling it. But if you do it anyway, because it doesn't matter how you feel, you'll find that once you get a little bit of momentum, you're just going to keep going. There's, I mean, so many days, man, like I don't feel like doing anything, but it doesn't matter how I feel. Like, does it really matter if I feel like doing this video or not? No, what matters is, am I living my life's purpose? Am I waking up and contributing? Am I doing something meaningful? And if I do that, it doesn't matter how I feel. In the end, I always feel good. So it doesn't matter if my wave of feeling good or bad because everybody, look, everybody has ups and downs. Your emotional state and how you feel as a human being will vary. Some weeks you might feel a bit more depressed. Some weeks you might feel a bit uh, more like normal. And some days you might may feel amazing for no reason. It's like a wave. It just keeps coming and going. But as an entrepreneur, for example, like I had to learn to completely act devoid of whatever that is. So it, it doesn't matter how I feel because if I only look for days that I feel like it, man, nothing's going to get done. Like zero, like absolutely zero. And the more you train yourself to act like this, the more successful you're going to be because then you're not going to care. And at the end of the day, when you want to get something done, it's not only about you, right? Like your work helps the world, helps someone else. And if you think about it more from a perspective of how am I serving and who am I helping and I'm doing it for them and just ignore yourself at all. Like I'm not important. Like I always say, it's like I'm not important. I don't care about how I feel the better uh, in some cases because your emotional state, same as everybody, is just so varied that it's not something that is a good guideline for whether you should do the work or not. Yeah. And the worst thing about it is like the hardest stuff that is the stuff that you feel the least like doing is the most rewarding and it's the stuff that's going to make you grow the most and the stuff that is going to make you the most successful. So the stuff that you least want to do is the stuff that is going to make you grow the most. That's the sad part as well. So you actually have to start doing things that are uncomfortable and conditioning yourself to keep going for that. Like start with small stuff. You know, when you eat something that is delicious, you know, stop halfway and just leave the rest for another day. When you're taking a shower, just squeeze a little bit into the cold, you know, just to give yourself a little bit of a shock. When you're doing in the gym, just try to do a little bit extra. Just try to do another rep or just throw in another set from time to time. Just challenge yourself. Challenge yourself with something new. Make yourself a little bit more uncomfortable. And you're going to notice that if you condition this muscle, you're going to get much more focused and you're going to feel happier with yourself because you're going to make yourself proud because you're consistently pushing the limits and that makes you really happy. Like as a person that makes us really happy seeing that we grow and that we progress. Uh, let me see. There's a couple other questions. Have you ever had tendinitis? What's the best way to recover? Yeah, I had a bunch of tendinitis. One of the most common ones for me personally were like the tennis elbow. And then I had a golfer's elbow from a couple of times. A lot of stretching. I would do a lot of stretching and I would be very careful how I use my hand when I'm doing my work. So I try to keep my entire arm on the desk 
So I'm not doing any kind of positions where I'm putting it in a, in a bad or awkward position. I don't sleep on that side. I just do some of the basic stuff, but I also always see a physio and I try to get some recommendations that are more individualized from someone who is a more of an expert on that specific thing. Because I think that as good as the internet is for self, you know, healing or learning about stuff, you should also talk to multiple experts in the area that are around you that it can look at you physically and then draw conclusions on that as well. Because you don't want to go just by your own diagnosis because it could be something really serious and that you're not discovering it early. So you don't want to be too stubborn so you don't go out and learn and you don't ask questions. It's like I definitely, any kind of sign of injury or something, I go to, I first discovered the top three experts in the area in that specific thing and I go and talk to all three of them and see if any of them, like if they can agree on one thing, what's wrong and what needs to be done. And if they all agree, and then I'm, I know that I'm pretty certain that this is what needs to be done. Cool. Great questions. <laughs> like cleaning your kitchen to cook healthy food. Yeah, absolutely. That, that can be quite uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, making your bed in the morning. You know, basic things like that. Making your bed, keeping the kitchen clean, always washing the dishes after a meal. You know, that one thing, like you'd be surprised. I, I lived, when I first started traveling the world as a nomad, I traveled the world for six years. I moved from country to country every three months and I was traveling with different roommates. I would be living with different people. And, uh, you know, you have people that have different sets of core values. But one thing that I haven't seen people do is that they don't have they don't have strict rules with how they handle themselves in the kitchen the house like if you guys lived with me if you saw how i do it like everything is very organized and systematic i don't leave any dirty dishes anywhere like i, I try to be more of like a soldier in that aspect because i think that discipline translates into everything like how you do those simple things translates into how you do the big things you know always taking out the trash on time always washing the dishes after the meal, right after the meal, like no waiting, no procrastination, like immediately, no instant gratification from delaying, just do it. And just having that attitude, like making the bed in the morning after you wake up, like just having that mentality of just doing the, the thing that is the right thing to do like immediately, and I think it translates so much that people don't realize. And if you start slacking these little things, I've noticed that then it starts bleeding into the big stuff as well. So that's something pretty cool. <laughs> How do I meditate usually? What would you recommend to someone just starting out? So actually with meditation, I see that for myself, what works the best is if I just don't do anything for 10 to 20 minutes after my first meal of the day, I take that 10 to 20 minutes, just look into the wall. I think that for me personally works the best. I tried all the apps. I tried everything you could imagine. Nothing really was as good as this. I just leave my phone, laptop is off. Just don't do anything. Just look at the wall for 10 to 20 minutes. And it's almost like thinking time in a sense and also meditation. And it just works like that. And I do, do that daily and it seems to do the trick. So I don't do any crazy long meditation practices or anything like that. I do 10 minutes or 20 minutes depending on how I feel and that's usually enough. And again, no apps, nothing fancy, no fancy positioning or anything. I just sit down where I'm very comfortable, where I'm not making any, like you see that sofa right there? That's basically where I meditate. Nothing. There's just nothing on the wall across and I just stare at the wall and it helps with focus. I really definitely notice the difference. If I look at the wall and if I'm not this, like if I'm paying attention, you can almost sense that there's this urge to go check your phone or check the laptop or there's this urge to rush to do something. And uh, it really, you feel it and then you ignore it over time and it becomes better. So pretty cool. How often and how many times do you perform your ab workouts? Well, let me see. Somewhere between uh, three and four times a week. 
that's, I would say like, yeah, if I look at my routine right now, three to four times a week, at the end of the workout, I usually throw in some abs. That's because I just don't usually have it structured in my routine. I just do it when I have the time. So if I have the time in that day, I'm just gonna do a longer workout and I'm gonna throw in 10 to 15 minutes of ab work at the end. And I'm gonna do that, I would say more three times per week than four, but I do try to train them as frequently as, you know, four or five times even. Uh, just because I don't do a lot of volume and a lot of the work that I do for my abs, it's more of, of static nature. So doing things like hollow holds, dead bugs, side planks, planks and movements like that. So more like stabilization movements. So they don't really make you sore so you can train much more frequently. And uh, the other movements that I do for my abs, like ab wheel rollouts and more like hanging leg raises and movements like that. For those I train, I would say twice a week, something like that, like cable crunches or similar like loaded movements. But a lot of what I do is stabilization stuff like McGill's big three are one of my favorite set of exercises to do. Uh, if you haven't looked into the data on Stuart McGill, uh, big three, and he's a spine researcher. So he does a lot of like uh, back pain stuff. And I've incorporated those into my routine and more of a preventive nature. And I just like how it helps me with my posture and everything. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Check that out. Like he does the bird dog. There's a couple of other movements that um, like side planks that you can incorporate in your routine. And it's pretty good corrective stuff to do a regular basis. I think it's going to definitely help your routine be better. If you have the time, of course, right? It's like similar with neck training. It's similar with trap training. It's like similar with forearm training and, and like calf training and ab training. In my mind, like these are not my main target groups that I want to train. I try to incorporate as many movements where I can passively or indirectly train it. But if I do have time, like if I legit have more time to do, I'm going to incorporate some of these and do some of that stuff but it's not the primary focus. Like I still want to train the other stuff. And if I'm pressed with time, that stuff goes out the window for sure. All right, cool. I'm going to take a couple more questions guys, just because we're, we're running a bit late here. So I don't want to turn this into like this massive long rant. So I'm going to just take a couple more questions. I really appreciate you guys. Your questions are freaking amazing. And I just really am uh, shocked at how many great questions we had tonight. By the way, if you haven't been following me on Instagram, uh, definitely do that. Uh, I'm just going to put it up here. Um, let me see if I can uh, check that out and put it in the chat so you guys can check that out. Uh, I post a lot of good stuff on Instagram so you guys can check that in the descriptions and the stories that I post and all that cool stuff. Let's see. Um... Motive ring. No, this is a uh, aura ring. So i have just testing this out right now. I'm not yet ready to fully endorse it. I usually recommend my clients to get something like a Garmin tracker. It's, it's okay. I mean, I do have to take it off when I'm training because it's super annoying when I'm doing like heavy deadlifts and things like that, but it's okay. Like it's, it's a nice little fashion accessory <laughs> more than just like a serious tracker, but yeah. Yeah, still testing it, okay? Thoughts on no fap. So I've done no fap before no fap was a thing. Like I've done no fap in like 2011, 2010. I've done no fap when David Data was talking about it. That was a long time ago. I think there is some merit to the idea of not giving yourself the comfort Thing. Like one of the ways, if you're constantly fapping as a man, you're just basically not very disciplined. Like you're going for something that is very easy to get and you kind of fake satisfaction. It will prevent you from actually going out, meeting people, hanging out with girls, guys, whatever you're into. And I think there's value in no fap because it actually forces you to get the hell out and approach people and talk to people and meet people, go to events, get out of your house. Because it's so easy to just stay home, you know, get some Kleenex, get do, get some good stuff on your laptop and not get anywhere. And then you're basically alone and miserable. So there is definitely value in that. And I definitely, I'm a big anti-porn. I think porn is like one of the reasons why people are having such a hard time be, being successful, like, like 
I see so many people that I meet at events and places like that, they accumulate a lot of bad habits like alcohol, porn, cigarettes, drugs in general, too much weed and all, all this kind of stuff. Like that stuff is great, but at some point, like th there's a point at which it will just destroy your life. So you gotta be very, very, very careful. And I don't know many people that can control all of that and, and still make it. So I'm more of a, like as far as no fap, I'm definitely up for that. I recommend it to everybody. Like if you are currently struggling with that, to be honest, like if you ever have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever, like you're you know, having a vibrant dating life, if you're going out with people, meeting people, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and probably you're not going to get as much value out of NoFap. But if you're currently like single and if you're not going out, if you're not taking action to improve yourself in social skills, you definitely should do NoFap because you don't deserve the fap. Like that fap needs to be earned. So if you're not putting in the work to improve yourself, you should not be spending your energy and getting any rewards for slacking out and being a procrastinator. So that's my stance, my quick stance on NoFap. Uh, my buddies at RSD, um, Julian and Max, they did a couple of videos on that. I definitely recommend. I did a video with Max about it, and uh, then we said we told Julian to do a video on it. I think he did like a couple of videos on it already. So I definitely recommend as well checking those out because I think our opinions definitely are uh, in line there. How to meet hot girls? Well, I'm not really an expert on that. I think you should definitely go and check out my buddy RSD Max to learn how to attract and how to first meet and then attract and date really attractive women if that's your thing and if that's what you want to achieve. You definitely got to work on yourself, but you also want to work on that skill set. It's a long journey. Uh, I've uh, gone through the journey myself. I was a very introverted guy before I started traveling the world and became a digital nomad and really started working on myself. I didn't date anybody. I had literally one girlfriend in my entire life before the age of like 24. And um, that was like totally by accident. It was definitely, I was a complete moron and a complete idiot. Uh, so yeah, like that definitely was a huge area of growth for me. Like I, I started at rock bottom basically and rebuilt everything. So it's a area that I think every man and every woman, but more, I think more importantly, men nowadays, they're just not, they have no idea how to cultivate their social skills. They have no idea how to behave. They have no idea how to meet people. And it's just a huge problem. So if you are like that guy, like I was, I was so introverted and shy. I couldn't talk to anybody, man. Like you definitely got to go into uh, my buddy, RSD max uh, stuff that generally what he's putting out is amazing. I think it's going to give you uh, some extra confidence and give you some structure and give you some new paradigm shifts to start getting out there and meeting people and going out to events, creating a social circle, going out to bars, clubs, whatever you're into. Like I personally hate nightclubs. I fucking hate nightclubs. I'm just saying this out loud. You guys see that it's a sensitive topic. I don't like to swear, but uh, I did go out to a lot of nightclubs uh, for like years and I just I just don't like it. I just don't like the nightclub culture. Like you got to stay up late until like five in the morning here in Europe. Oftentimes it's even later here in Spain. I mean, the clubs close like 7 a.m. So if you want to go out and have a night, man, like you're going to be up until the dawn. So I don't like to do it now. I, I don't go out anymore like that. I just don't like it. It just disrupts my rhythm and I'm not very productive. And as an entrepreneur, I just don't like to do that. Um, because I think it, it's the, the value of it is not um, enough to justify the investment. Now, meeting people during the day, like going to coffee shops, going to events, doing stuff like that, I think that's definitely the way to go. Uh, if you also want to preserve your routine and go to bed on time and really have a cool, nice lifestyle, I think that's really cool. So definitely check out RSD Max. I think he's the best person to talk to about this kind of stuff. Uh, let me see. Uh, do you drink coffee? No, I don't drink coffee. I am uh, hypersensitive to caffeine. So if I have some coffee, I just go freaking mental. Like I never have caffeine deliberately. I have some caffeine from dark chocolate and I get some caffeine from tea or maybe kombucha a little bit. But if I actually get 
caffeine from coffee or pre-workout, I just go mental. Like it's so crazy. And I don't like to do that because I have a crash afterwards and it just disrupts me and my whole sleep as well. I just don't like to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna take two more questions and then we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, two good ones, okay? So I'm just gonna go through some of the stuff here. Just gonna scroll a little bit. Um, when is the next collab with RSD Max? I don't know at the moment. I think he's in the US, I'm in Barcelona. I'm not planning to travel anywhere close, maybe sometime in 2019. I don't really know. Yeah, but we'll try to make it happen you know, just to make sure we add some value. What do you recommend to make money online? Okay, so it's kind of a weird question to someone that does fitness, but okay, I'll I'll explain to you my quick <laughs> philosophy about money. Money is a side effect of adding value, right? When you add value, in return, you will get money. Money itself isn't really something that you should focus on if you want to be an entrepreneur, or if you want to be a freelancer or someone who wants to provide a service, you will get money if you solve problems in the marketplace. So I, I get this question a lot and I am working with some people. I'm doing some business coaching on the side. I'm, I'm helping some younger entrepreneurs and the real good, like the mindset to have, it's okay, what is the problem? Am I solving the problem for my potential client or the company or whoever I'm working for? And if you can solve that problem effectively, you're gonna get money in return for that. It's an exchange of value. So money in itself, it's not important, but the problem that you're solving is important. That's what you wanna identify. Can you solve a problem? What is the value that you're going to add? Like we get a lot of people, I mean, you know, I get pitched every single day. Like every single day as an entrepreneur, you get pitched. Like people go on my website, they go into contact form, it's like, Mario, you know, you wanna buy my services, I'm gonna blow up your Instagram, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do sales for you, I'm gonna do your marketing, I'm gonna clean your house, I'm gonna do this or that or whatever. I mean, not many of those people that approach me, I think like one out of a hundred, legitimately came at it from a perspective of understanding where I'm at in my business and what problems do I have now and what would I need help with? As everybody has problems or things that they would like to improve. So you as a, someone who's entering the marketplace and if you wanna make it, regardless if you wanna build an ads agency or become a freelancer like I was at some point, I was uh, a marketing freelancer. Like I just started from scratch, basically learned how to do some marketing skills and I started offering my services for a very low investment and I provide a ton of value. I even work for free for multiple companies until I got one paid client because I wanted to get at testimonials for my work. And until I did that, like, you know, the value is the key. If I can't provide value, I'm not supposed to get anything in return. So look for ways to add value look for ways to solve problems for people. And if you do that, and if you add a tremendous amount of value, you got the money part solves itself almost. And it's definitely something you gotta know your worth, but also know your worth when you're starting that it's pretty much zero. Like if you don't have any skills, if you have no testimonials, no proof that your stuff works, yeah, like the value that you, you offer is not very much. So don't ask too much for it. But when you get really good at something, when you're like a kick-ass Facebook person or a kick-ass something like a copywriter or a salesperson or whatever, then ask for it. Like then ask for the money that you deserve if you provide the value, right? So don't ask for the money if you can't provide the value. It's simple as that, right? And if you can solve problems again, if you first identify the problem, then if you can solve the problem, that's it, that's a business. A business just solves problems. My, my business solves problems, we help entrepreneurs and professionals, busy entrepreneurs and professionals get in the best shape of their life. That's what we solve. That's my life mission. That's my purpose. I mean, my purpose here, I don't know if you guys checked out, uh, you can go to the about page of my website. I wrote out my mission, my vision, my goal, my goals, my core values and everything. One of the core values is to educate the world and make the world a healthier place and help people become better people and leave a, a dent in this world because I was here. So, 
that is solving a problem. Like I identify the problem. People don't really know how to get in the best shape of their life. They need help to organize these things and to live a healthier lifestyle and what to do, when to do it, how to do it. I come in and solve that problem. And if you can do that, you don't have to do it in fitness. Fitness is really hard actually. But if you do it in an, any niche, it doesn't matter what it is, but you're solving a problem. Like if you're helping lawyers get clients, if you're helping someone as a lawyer, if you're a doctor helping someone you know, get rid of something like an illness, if you're a teacher helping kids do something or the school organize something, like there's so many ways you could add value that it's incredible. Like that's the beauty about business and being an entrepreneur is that there's so many problems. And as an entrepreneur, you're really like a problem seeking and a problem solving machine. That's what you are. That's what you need to see the world as. Like it, the world is full of problems that you're trying to solve. Like this thing here, look at this. This solves a problem. Like I had an issue with my phone. If I wanted to check something out on an airplane and I was watching some content, I couldn't place my phone without it falling apart. Some great entrepreneur came up with this. So it's like a little thing here that I just pull out and I, now I can put my phone on there. And that's why I bought it. That's why I spent the money and he got the money because he solved the problem for me. It's simple as that. Like what problem can you solve? And if you can think like this, you're going to become a real entrepreneur or a, a linchpin, someone of high value for the company that you work for because you're able to identify problems in the world and fix them. Most of the reasons why we live, and I'm going to end this on the, like, the reasons why we live such a great life right now is because of entrepreneurs, like a big part of it, entrepreneurs and people that improve technology to such a point where we can have this conversation, we can enjoy having light at this time of the day, I can enjoy having food in my house that's fresh for days, I can you know, go to the gym, I have this amazing chair, I have this laptop, I have this amazing microphone, I have everything. The, all this is technology and all of this is someone just thinking, man, how can I make this better? How can I solve the problem? And then they find a solution. And that's how you make the world a better place. You identify problems and you contribute with finding the solution. So that's how you become an entrepreneur. And that's it. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate you guys. I think this went a bit longer than I really wanted to. So I appreciate um, you guys' attention. You've been here for such a long time. Uh, definitely follow me on Instagram. If you haven't been on um, on Instagram for a while, like, I. Uh, I've done some work there as well. I'm just going to put a link up here. I'm actually going to share some links in the chat. Uh, just bear with me for a second. I'm going to share the link to my top books. And uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me for coaching and things like that, if you're interested in joining some of my programs and working with me personally, if you're an entrepreneur or busy professional that wants help in this area of your life, you can go to my website and there's a contact form there. You can just send me a message and um, me and my team will look at the, all those messages and we'll reach back out to you and uh, you know, we'll see if it's a good fit. Other than that, I really, again, appreciate your time. I hope you are having a great Sunday and now coming up into this week that you have a game plan to crush it. I certainly do and I wish you guys all the best and I'm going to sign off right now and um, as I said, love you all. I'll see you guys soon.